So how long has the relationship been? And how long of those four years has it been all work and no peace? <laughs> Are you a masochist? A bit. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, since I don't know her and I haven't watched the two of you, I can't give you any specifics in the sense that I could diagnose the issue. Right. So all I can do is give you some general thoughts on the issue, having been a relationship counselor for 23 years by now. Right. So meaning I can tell you a few things that you can consider. And then, of course, you have to, you know, uh, inquire into your personal situation with somebody who knows both of you or for yourself in, in some detail. So. Let's see where I'll start. One of the greatest issues in relationship and why relationships fail is that the purpose of the relationship is not clear or is no longer aligned. So those are some of the options. So one of the ways of saying that is sometimes people get into relationship and they don't know why they are in relationship. Right. They just got together, it's nice, and now here they are in a relationship. And one person might want marriage and children, let's say that's a common one, while the other one just wants to have fun or travel or <coughs> something like that. Right. Um, or two people get into a relationship and they do want the same thing, like personal growth, maybe in your case. Yeah. And... So then, or, or children, right? And so then they look at the relationship as a way to achieve that particular purpose, whatever that is. So if yours is personal growth, right? Then you get together for personal growth. Well, personal growth, aside from if that's a good idea for a relationship, which is a whole other discussion we can have in a second, but personal growth, um, when you look at that, if, if, you, you know, if you consider other avenues of personal growth, they're usually not that pleasant, right? So in general, the purpose of personal growth, um, in its very definition, if you believe in personal growth, means that uh, you're going to um, be in moments of increased pressure that will either cause you to break or grow. Right? That's what personal growth is about. Right? How uh, the motivations for personal growth can be anywhere from really healthy to really fucked up. Right? So when you come from a place of I'm not good enough and hence I need to grow, that's a battle you can never win. You know, you can do Tony Robbins, whatever the Platinum Club, and and you know, do your daily affirmations and do your whatever. What are those workouts called? PX something, yeah, whatever. You know, those things, and then you can like uh, pray, and then you'll do your lists, and then you follow the time management, and then you have your coaching call, and you know, you're never going to feel better because there's intrinsically something wrong with the with the orientation of personal growth, right? That's the, that's the very one end. The other end is that you are intrinsically interested in your development, human development, and skill development. Service. And, hmm? and service. And service, right? And so you um, develop yourself for the sake of others, for the sake of your best self, for the sake of, you know, why not? Essentially, so that's the full spectrum of personal growth, but nowhere on that spectrum is it pleasant, really, right? So, when your um, idea of relationship changes because maybe you've had enough personal growth for the time being, or you've worn yourself out, and there's only so much a, a human can do till they need some break or some rest, because you wouldn't do personal growth every day, all day, uh, in, in any other domain, right? Uh, you wouldn't work out every day, all day. 
uh, or you know, acquire a new skill every day, all day. So if your idea of a purpose in a relationship changes, but hers doesn't, then you become incompatible. Well, that's one of the things that can happen where you go, well, I'd actually just like a little bit of fun and an easy time, and I'd like it pleasant, and would like to come home and not have to work. And, <clears throat> and maybe I'd like to catch a breath ever so often, and the night sleep without waiting for the next upset, right? So, so at that point, you, and if she goes, yeah, well, that would be nice. I think that would be lovely. Uh, I don't know how we'll do that, but I'm up for that. Then you'd go and do some relationship counseling or something and figure out how can you create peace and breath and you know all of that kind of stuff. If that's possible, great. If not, then you'll break up. Right? But if she says, no, I like this, or demonstrates that she likes it, even though she might say that she doesn't, and you are done, then that's one consideration. However, the other consideration is that if you've entered a relationship for the sake of personal growth, like I was asking you somewhat in jest earlier, or if you're a masochist, right, there is a bit of that in there. You have to look at why have you chosen a woman who is that difficult to deal with, right? And I'm sure we could find the answer probably in your upbringing somewhere. That's usually how it goes. We pick people who replicate the patterns of our childhood. And so now you can look at the fact that you are probably seeking love the way you received love as a child, which is probably through conflict. And somebody nagging and being, you know, demanding things of you that you maybe can bring but don't really want to bring. You always feel a little bit bad and insufficient, so you need to grow a little bit more, you know, all of that. And that's a losing battle because as long as you engage in that, you're going to be stuck in that particular pattern and there's no pushing through. Now, there's no saying, though, just to round out the picture, that you, wouldn't pick, that you would pick another woman differently, unless you're crystal clear on the fact that, you, that you're done with a certain kind of a pattern, right? Because otherwise, you'll get yourself a nice, peaceful, quiet woman, you know, who's just, it's so peaceful, it's so lovely, no shoes, no bra, no trouble, you know? <laughs> she massages you every evening, there's food on the table, it's amazing, and then, what are you going to do? Probably, right? Maybe, maybe not. Right? Because also, from what you said yesterday, you could always supplement a little bit of trouble on the side. <laughs> right? Trouble is better in the casual capacity. Yes. If you have a... <laughs> yeah. If you are, as you are in this relationship, if you have a polyamorous setup, I would, yeah, you know, supplement the spices on the side, not as the main course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that's the answer there. But of course, right, that's, that's uh, you have to take into account where are you? Are you actually willing to no longer stick your head in the meat grinder every single day for the sake of feeling like you've accomplished something? Right? And if that's if that's true, then you can make changes in your relationship. If that's not true, then any woman you will have a relationship with will stick your head in the meat grinder or help you stick your head into the meat grinder. <laughs> you know? So does that? Yeah. No. But at some point, I, I see all of you. <laughs> At some point in your life, and, and your age is a good age, you have to consider the toll that kind of engagement takes on your nervous system, right? Because... You have to ask, is that what you want to do with your life? Yeah. You know, this, uh, this uh, yeah. circle of, you know, yeah. growth, so to speak. Yeah. For what reason? Otherwise, it's uh, all wretched, no vomit. <laughs> you know, the can down the road, you know. So you have to say, why are you growing? Why, what for? Yeah. 
You know, when you're finished growing, what are you going to do with all that growth, for instance, etc., etc.? And so that becomes an energy apportioning uh, yeah. question. And, and your nervous system, you know, will get fried over time. And your question yesterday was, how can I relax my body more? And that's, the, that's a direct correlation to being under constant duress. You can't actually relax. You might, you might train your body to become more relaxed, but that pull up you have in your lower body is a direct result of constant threat, right? And so... Um, you, you'll probably notice that in the last practice we did, right? That practice can only go so deep as your body is relaxed. And you'll hit a threshold in that practice and in your life where the, 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 the panic in your body or the threat in your body um, prevents you from being able to go deeper. And you were saying on the first day, right, you've done a lot of these practices or whatever, and how, do, how does it go deeper? Well, Deeper is by relaxing your nervous system, which relaxes the base of your body, which gives you access to whole other layers of, you know, experience. So. It's really important to fully accept someone as they are. If you don't, then you can't, you can't really accurately relate to them or even uh, determine, um, when I say fully, I mean, you know, as fully as you can. Uh, you can't determine whether or not you like them or not, really, unless you can accept them for who they are. Doesn't mean so when you accept someone for who they are, it doesn't necessarily mean you put up with who they are. But denying, you know, not accepting someone for who they are in a certain way, you know, by I'm playing with words a little bit, yeah. and I'm trying to sort of create two different things rather than out of something that is sometimes one. So when I, accepting someone how they are just uh, can mean being okay with that person as they are in relationship to you and not leaving them or something like that. It can mean that. But we can make it more refined and we can say that we can accept someone as they are, being willing, in other words, to see them. And then accepting that that's how they are and then making the decision on an ongoing basis whether you want to be with that person or not. You know, given that this person is like that. Because sometimes we don't accept someone as they are and we, and we uh, sort of live with this dual relationship with who they are and who we'd like them to be. You know, this, okay, this, uh says that a lot. Like dating a fix-me-upper. You know, fix-her-upper, isn't it? Yeah, fix-her-upper. You know, it's good value. Cheap. Not as many people interested. <laughs> but, you know, with a little bit of work, she could be, you know, fix-her-upper. You know? <laughs> like that, you know. But at a certain level, <laughs> it's not as easy with people as this with like, you know, mm. condos and cities. <laughs> <laughs> But there's more things, I think, to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you said that, well, you can't date potential, right? You can't date potential. Well, I mean, you, of course, always want more, I mean, and deeper and all of that. That's a different story, but fundamentally you have to be okay with who somebody is. That doesn't mean you have to be with everything they do. Like, for instance, um, I don't know, you're dating a woman, you really like her, you like who she is in general, you know, with a few, I mean, nobody's perfect. But, you, you know, she, let's say she works for a bank, you know, and she wants to progress in the bank, uh, but somehow you think money is evil and she shouldn't be working for a bank or so. Well, that's an actual issue because unless this is just some casual job for her that she could do this one or that one. But if she has a career you don't like, that's an actual issue, right? But like, for instance, if she, I don't know, doesn't wash her hair often enough because she's not aware of the fact that her scalp smells after three days. You'd be surprised what people get, you know, or, or, or she eats in a way that you don't like or something. Those are things you can address for her sake, right? Not for your sake, but for her sake, because you're not the only one who's smelling the scalp or listening to her eat with an open mouth, right? You go to a restaurant, everybody else is kind of like, all right, lady, where were you raised, right? You know, so, 
those are things those are things that can be addressed where you can go i don't know if you're aware of the fact that you open your mouth when you're eating and your food spills out while you're talking to people while you're eating right if she goes yeah i'm fully aware of that and that's who i am well then you have to deal with can you stomach it or not mm -hmm. but if it's just a matter of a bit of refinement here or there that's perfectly okay and supporting somebody in uh, going for the job that they want to is perfectly okay. Um, but, you know, things like looks, uh, career, things around children, religion, political ideology, you don't want to fuck with that. Mm -hmm. But you have to assume that because somebody wants to change does not necessarily mean they will change, as we all know. <laughs> right? Because how, how long does it take you to change a habit? Right. So if it takes her as long as it takes you to change a habit, that might be a long time. And can you live with her the way she is now till she's changed? Right? If she, of course, everybody changes in relationship, particularly if you engage in long-term relationships. It's a, it's a very, you know, it's startling you know, how much people change. And it, it's always a matter of, are you changing in, in ways that are agreeable, which might be, or um, sometimes it becomes not agreeable and then you have what they call so lovely in divorce court, irreconcilable differences. <laughs> you know? so. Relationship is built on sameness. So if you want a good relationship, the more you have in common, the better your relationship. Sexual attraction or erotic friction is built on opposites. So if you're only after erotic friction and you don't care how the relationship goes, then you'd go with your opposite. But if you have nothing in common with someone and you fuck like crazy and it's amazing, but the moment you're not fucking, which is probably at least 23 hours a day, <laughs> or for some people 22 maybe, but... <laughs> You are fighting like mad and you can't agree on anything. That's not a workable relationship. Well, so it's true that opposites attract, but it's also true that resonance, meaning sameness in relationship, which, which is, is the thing that creates long-term functioning relationships. Well, the more you have in common, the better your relationship will be. Right? And so relationship counseling is for the areas of your relationship where you are not aligned. Yeah. Right? So if people can't communicate, that's a relationship issue. If people don't agree on having children or not, relationship issue. If people can't agree on how to spend money, relationship issue. People don't know uh, or, or don't agree on their political affiliations or where they want to live, relationship issue. People are no longer being sexually attracted to each other but having a lovely relationship, sex issue. Nothing to do with relationship has to do with the lack of opposites. So yeah, so the more opposite you have, the more natural polarity you have, but also the more tension and friction in the relationship you have. It's not called erotic friction for nothing, right? And, or erotic tension. It's, it's the very thing that makes it hot sex and sexy, makes it impossible to actually live together. So... <laughs> Oh, you could always, you know, you could always not live together. But even the hottest relationship, your know, hottest sexual attraction over time, of course, wears off. And then you have nothing left, right, which is not so good. No, it's actually not that depressing because erotic friction, as you have all experienced, is a trainable skill. Right? If you can create a semblance of erotic friction with every single person in the room, which most of you did, with a few you know, random exceptions, there's no reason to believe that you couldn't create that kind of erotic friction with your intimate partner who you actually like <laughs> and actually want to have sex with, right? So. But it's a chicken and an egg thing. You're absolutely right. Most women will overlook most things men, that they complain about in their men if there's adequate and satisfying sex. Right? So things like dirty dishes, dirty socks, dirty floors, 
uh, unpaid, this um, make no difference to most women if there is adequate satisfying sex, right? The problem, though, sadly is, it's, it's, it's sadly true. Um, and you know that because I know people who are sexual wizards but have all kinds of other things that are, would be questionable, but nobody complains because they're really good in that particular domain. If this one uh, neighbor where I live, who is, I don't even, I don't even know where to start. He's a, he's an artist, so you, you, can, you, you know what that means, right? Bills are never paid. He only, he only works when he absolutely has to. He has three cars, all of which are an unbelievable mess. But the women are insane about him because he knows how to fuck. There's no other way of saying it. So nobody cares that he lives in a dump, essentially, drives a dump, and you know, most of the time whines and complains because he's just an incredibly good lover. Right? If he was an incredibly good lover, the first thing women would go is, clean up your shit, right? You're like, there's like shit everywhere. And it's like, but they don't because, right? But so that's a, that's a little side note. But, but if you happen to be in a long-term relationship or you're working with people who are in long-term relationship, the reason why men no longer want to go there sexually, aside from the, 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 the obvious wearing off of the polarity, which can be fairly easily fixed, is that... Um, there has been so much resentment and nagging that it's no longer yeah. easy to go there, yeah. right? So it's a chicken and an egg thing. Yes, uh, good sexual engagement would calm all of that, uh, but is there a willingness to be sexually engaged is a different story. Yeah. Uh, but for the sake of the relationship, properly addressing resentments is very, very important. Once worked with a couple, I flew to London every two weeks, I think, three weeks, every three weeks for six months, and every freaking weekend I was there, it was just a litany of complaints and resentments and unspoken stuff from the first affair he had to the last affair she had and their spending and their this, and, and it was, I mean, it was suicide-inducing. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, together with some somatic release and and appropriate bodily stuff and stuff, they managed to get it together eventually. But you know, it wasn't easy. So yeah, and there comes a moment where it's just done. Right? Sometimes you look at people and you just go, "Okay, okay can you break up already?" Right? It's just, like, it's just, it's not going to get better, and you're wasting the last few years you know, of your, of your vibrant life on punishing each other. Well, there's no way to say that till we know the exact details of the pattern, right? So I would know the exact details of the pattern, but the thing that I can say, as I said to him, is when your nervous system has a certain kind of a load, right? So there's a how shall I say this? When your childhood, in whatever which way, was such that you have come to thrive on conflict, for whatever reasons, right? Then the thriving on conflict and needing conflict for a certain amount of feeling alive or loved or um, stimulated, right, is... Uh, it's like a sugar addiction or something like that, right? It, it's, it's a relying on a cycle that involves someone else uh, that's a negative or a toxic um, uh, behavior pattern. And as long as you have to keep that behavior pattern alive, you are also inflicting that on other people, right? So whatever she does, and he, you know, it's, it's never one person. It's not like one person is perfectly happy and fine and healthy and the other person is fucked up, fucking up the relationship. It's two people participating willingly in something that they know from their upbringing. But 
as long as that, if long as one person enacts it, the other person will get triggered into it. If this person enacts it, this person will get triggered into it. And it's like this thing where they're locked in this death lock of that particular behavior. And the only way out of, well, there's two ways out of it. Disengage, right? That's, that's, and then deal with what that is. Or no longer engage in the thing uh, and completely relax the nervous system and relax the habit patterns and repair the damage done to the nervous system. Because it's a damage. It's a constant stress pattern. It shows up almost not as severe as a PTSD, but in the same behavior realms. So if hypothetically somebody is afflicted with that, the first thing you do is you release as much of that tension pattern from your body. Uh, somatic work, somatic movement, um, so, you know, somatic therapies. Uh, there's something called somatic experiencing, which is a psychotherapy and bodily release technique. Um, regular therapy to pinpoint the exact pattern, but mostly releasing it through the body. There's a few people in here who are learning something called the nonlinear movement method. Raise your hand if you're learning the nonlinear movement method. So these are your Australian contingents of the nonlinear movement method, which is specifically a non-force release of trauma patterns in the body. So they're about to get done with training next week. So you can check, you know, get everybody's... Uh, that's, a, that's a very easy non-force way of dealing with things. I would still suggest that in addition to somatic release, you also do some kind of somatic experiencing where somebody speaks with you and tracks your body while it's happening. Right? Non-linear is a completely non-verbal, non-force uh, where you access your body's own intelligence and then somatic experiencing. There's a website um, I can point you toward. There's lots of practitioners in, the, in Australia where it's a combination of cognitive understanding of what's happening and then how it affects the body and learning to unfreeze certain things in the body. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I think theoretically, well, there's two, there's two schools of thought. One is that nothing that the brain has ever carved into its patterns ever goes away, right? And that's a necessity because um, the patterns you learn, of course, are networked with other patterns. And so, you know, if when somebody promises you they can eliminate a pattern, let's say they can eliminate your fear of flying pattern. Well, that fear of flying pattern is networked with a whole bunch of other stuff. If that would really disappear, then all other kind of stuff would disappear. And so, you know, suddenly you find yourself, you can no longer drive while you're driving, right? Or something like that. So the brain makes it so that everything that has ever been learned is there forever. However, how active a neural pathway is, is a completely different story. So you can create an alternate um, pathway, so to speak, so that the information and the electrical impulse goes down a different road. And this road becomes, so to speak, overgrown and no longer used. So that's very possible. But of course, one of those things with those overgrown, no longer used roads is that they were the, prime, that they were the earliest roads. So they're the best networked. So it's highly unlikely that you're never going to end up on that road, right? So because you would have to rewire everything. But technically speaking, it is possible to um, block access to a road, so to speak, and create a much stronger road somewhere else. And like, for instance, one classic example for that is language, mm -hmm. right? So I grew up speaking Austrian, and so everything up to when I left... Um, Europe, because I lived in Austria and I lived in Germany, so I spoke German till I was 26, right? And then I spoke only English, other than once a week with my parents or so. Right? So my uh, English is now my primary language. I dream in English. I even count in English, which was the longest 
I used to count in, in German long after everything else had gone to, and math, right? But, but now everything's English, and I can write a lot better in English than I can in German, believe it or not, right? Because I haven't written in German in 20-something years, right? So, um, so my Austrian patterns are not really that accessed. But the moment I speak Austrian, everything that comes with that, including the cultural behaviors, the mannerisms, the way my body holds itself, comes back. And it's hilarious <laughs> because I go home and I spend a week with my parents and I can tell my body shifts, right? And it's not entirely pleasant at times, right? Because that part of me hasn't been used and isn't really... Like the Manchurian candidate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit like that. Hello, doctor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, so that gives you... <laughs> Not really, but no. <laughs> but, but yes. So, you know, meaning, meaning that's a classic example of... Can you get rid of those attachment points and stuff like that? Yes, you can. But when they come back, they'll come back online really quickly. Right. So, for instance, um, you know, sometimes people go on ayahuasca journeys and stuff like that, and they report that when they have done that, there's other ways to do it too, in somatic release, for instance, that stuff is just gone. Like smoking, for instance. Like smoking, right? Uh, or certain painful uh, physical conditions or memories or stuff like that. Capacity to earn a living. Capacity to earn a living. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, sudden <ur> <laughs> yeah, the sudden urge to disclose one's deepest psyche on Facebook right after an ayahuasca trip, <laughs> all of those things. But, I mean, I'm, you know, the, the, you can somatically release things and they're gone. And... Uh, and I certainly can say that that's true even within my own body, that I've just released certain things. But the patterning in the mind, it might not be stored in my body anymore, but I can still access it. And so it's both arduous repetition and building new patterns and finding the right access to release. There's all kinds of modalities, amongst them cognitive behavioral Therapy, right? There's all and, and and can work on triggers. You can, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to to give yourself enough space that when the trigger hits, you are not just running down that road. But of course, as long as you and, and this is the problem with cognitive therapies, and I'm saying this having been, you know, a counselor for many years, um, and having done extensive academic work around this as well. Um, there's only so much talking and knowing can do for you because the, the body pattern is so strong that it overrides for the most part your knowledge. The best you can hope for is that you get enough space that you can put your body in a different position, so to speak, right? Or you create a state break that makes it you don't go down that road. But if you actually work on releasing things from your body, that's a much, um, I don't know, much more effective route. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there have been uh, uh, experiments done and... You all know that because you've also been part of that experiment uh, just by dating, right? It's like you can, you can line up, I don't know, I can line up 15 men for Tina and they all are her type, right? And they all fulfill the criteria and you bet she will pick the one the, of all the ones that are pretty much similar that has the kind of patterning that fits with her patterning. And in the beginning, it never looks like that, right? But you have this feeling that you've known each other forever. And it's like, <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're, if you're new age inclined, you think you've met in a past life or things like that. And yes, it's a past life. It's your childhood, right? <laughs> and, and that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. We've all done it, including myself. So. <laughs> He's nothing. He's nothing like my father. Right. Wait three years and you're right there. Right. And the last thing I want to say about that is that if you're not working on those things, they've also done research on um, how long it takes in an arranged marriage till those patterns show up. And so they say that if you pick somebody with whom you have the you have the lock, it takes up to 10 years to resolve that if you're working hard on it. If you had an arranged marriage, it takes 10 years and then you have made your partner into your whatever father or mother. So there's no escape. <laughs> Other than diligent somatic release. Yeah. Okay, so you were asking, somebody was asking what to do when you don't have partners at home. Oh, single? Yeah, most of these practices can be done by yourself, right? Meaning cultivating different energies in your body, becoming embodied, being relaxed, relaxing the base of your body. Your demographics might be slightly different, but if you're single, there's no reason not to actively practice. And when I'm saying practice, I'm not saying you should foist manipulative techniques on random women. But being available to an interaction is always good. Being able to feel somebody's heart and allow your heart to be involved always good. Being able to create erotic friction when appropriate, always good. Right? And sometimes you'll fuck up and sometimes it will be great, but there's no reason not to actively engage. And as Steve said, you can have a deep heart connection with the magpie and, and the magpie will respond. You know, A loving open heart isn't ever a wrong thing can do it with the bum on the beach, you can do it with a tree, yeah. And if you don't have, if you have a partner at home as a man, you can just apply all the things you've learned here without telling your partner what you're doing. If you're having a partner at home as a woman, you're shit out of luck because the moment you teach him, you become the one guiding the whole experience. So the best you can do as a woman is display the skills you've learned without speaking about them, right?